Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Maine Experience, Secretary of State Dunlap Reflects on Maine's Use of RCV in 2018. The webinar will begin shortly. My name is Chris Hughes, and I serve as Policy Director for the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. I will be your moderator for today's session. First, we need to cover a few housekeeping matters. Participants have been muted for this webinar to reduce audio interference since we have a maximum number of attendees with us today. If you have technical issues, please use the question option to send a message to the organizer so we may try to assist. To expand or minimize the control panel, click the orange arrow of your webinar taskbar. If you have a question or comment regarding the webinar, please type that message in the question box. To keep this webinar to about 45 minutes and out of respect for your time, there will only be a brief question and answer session at the end. Questions we are unable to address during this live session will be answered in a follow-up document which we will email to attendees and post with a recording of this session on the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center website in one to two weeks. The Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center provides a compilation of best practices and firsthand experiences from jurisdictions that have used this method of voting. The website, rankedchoicevoting.org, and the overall project serve as resources for voters, election administrators, policymakers, candidates, and others. The Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is education focused. We aim to provide resources that allow jurisdictions to implement ranked choice voting effectively and efficiently. With extensive elections experience and working together overseeing statewide, municipal, and district RCV elections, our team has focused on expanding the resources and information available regarding the administration of and education about this voting method. We are available to discuss whether or not RCV is an option for your jurisdiction and to assist in developing implementation plans, processes for tabulating results, voter education, and more. Our services are free, including travel. Now, Gary Bartlett, director of the RCVRC and former state elections director of for North Carolina, will introduce today's presenter. Thank you, Chris. On June 12, 2018, Maine held their first statewide primary uh, using ranked choice voting for certain offices. Secretary of State Matt Dunlap was gracious enough to share Maine's experience implementing this voting method in our August 2nd webinar. Secretary Dunlap gave an in-depth, insightful, first-hand account of administering a ranked choice voting election, lessons learned, and next steps to implement the general election. One of his foremost goals from the beginning was to ensure transparency. In his words, and I quote, let people know what we were doing, end of quote. This attention to detail produced a successful primary and general elections in a contentious environment. Secretary Dunlap is Maine's 49th Secretary of State and is now serving his fourth consecutive and seventh overall term of office. He is the first person to serve non-consecutive terms in that office since 1880. He previously served three terms as Maine's 47th Secretary of State. He is the past president of the National Associations of Secretaries of State. He served four terms in the Maine House of Representatives, representing part of Old Town and the Indian Island Voting District. In recognition of his hard work, he received Maine's Public Administrator of the Year in 2008. He resides in Old Town with his wife and daughter. Now, the Honorable Matt Dunlap. Well, thank you, Gary, for that introduction. It's probably more than people really um, needed to know, but uh, nonetheless, here I am, and we're here to talk about ranked choice voting. So a couple of things about this. There's, we have a bunch of slides to show. And this has sort of been modified from the presentations that we made to the public in the run-up to the June primary that Gary described. We've never done this before, and there is a lot of attention being paid, and we sort of felt instinctively that the best way for us to be successful um, was basically to be transparent, let people know where we were, even if we weren't exactly sure where we were going. So uh, I'm going to start um, a slideshow now if I can share your screen, show my screen. There we go. And then start there. There we go. All right. So this is, uh, there's a lot of slides here and I want to emphasize there's a lot of detail. Some of its points of reference. These are meant to be apocryphal, not heroic. 
we did go through quite a few things here and um, um, let me, so this is where it came from. So ranked choice voting has been talked about for a long time. When I was in the legislature, people were talking about it um, with many, uh, with the increasing use of uh, candidacy to promote various visions and agendas. We saw a lot of multi-candidate races over the last few decades and people were beginning to scratch their heads a little bit about people being elected to major office with sometimes less than 40% of the vote. And as technology has improved, people began discussing uh, ways to develop consensus around elected leaders, including uh, instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting. So it was proposed many times from 2001 forward. In 2014, there was a citizen, a citizen initiative that was proposed to do it statewide. We've been doing it in the city of Portland since 2011 to elect the mayor. And that was a, a, a real innovation that sort of paved the way for us as a model as to how we were going to go forward. Um, one of the things that we noticed right away is that in the pro initial proposal that was brought forward by the proponents, there were some pretty major gaps um, in the way they drafted that legislation that was presented to the voters in November 2016. Things like, you know, how would ballots be gathered um, for, a, for a central count? Um, we have 503 voting municipalities. Some are hand count, some are machine count. Um, and we were scratching our heads how to make it work under the proposal as it was presented to the voters. Now, it was ratified by the voters uh, to, to be used in elections beginning in 2018. And um, that sort of led immediately to, you know, we sort of assumed probably naively that the legislature, once the voters had ratified ranked choice voting, that the legislature would go to work on it. At the time, we had a divided legislature. We had a Democratic majority in the House and a Republican majority in the Senate and um, a, a Republican governor um, who was very unfriendly to the idea. The Senate went to the Supreme Court and asked for a, a solemn occasion to be declared, which would allow the Supreme Court to weigh in on an advisory opinion. So the constitutional question really revolved around uh, plurality, the use of plurality in elections, which had been in effect in Maine since about 1880. After the election of 1879, which was a three-way race for governor, under the constitutional construct at the time, and we've amended our constitution about 200 times, so it's changed quite a bit. But under that construction, if nobody got a, a clear majority, then the legislature would determine the outcome, which was a great idea, except um, the Secretary of State didn't run elections back in those days. It was actually run by largely local political committees. Um, nothing could ever go wrong there. And there were enough questions about legislative races that control the legislature began to shift, which led to a near insurrection. It's a very colorful story, but when it was all over, um, they amended the constitution and basically said, whoever gets the most votes wins. This runs afoul of the idea of ranked choice voting, which goes through rounds until you get to a clear majority. So the court's advisory opinion, which was issued um, you know, later in that, in that legislative session basically said if somebody were to challenge ranked choice voting on the, on the basis of plurality, it would probably be ruled unconstitutional. So, um, you know, we had a, a couple of issues around, uh, you know, getting the legislature to find agreement. Uh, there was, you know, again, there was a bit of a scrum. And then finally in October of uh, 2017, they, they came together and put in a delay mechanism uh, for ranked choice voting um, until 2022. And then if the constitution was not amended to address these concerns by December, 2021, the whole thing would sunset and be repealed. Well, the proponents of ranked choice voting who had gotten this on the ballot and, be, and into the law were not amused by this proposal and uh, began a people's veto effort, which runs on the exact same signature threshold as an initiative. At the time it was 61,123 signatures which represents 10% of the number of people that voted for governor in the previous gu gubernatorial election. Um, so they're out there at 10 below zero, the wind blowing a, blowing a gale all winter, and they got their signatures and they, we validated those on March 5th, uh, which said that we're, that meant that we were gonna have a vote on whether or not we're gonna have ranked choice voting. That submission also affected a stay on the delay mechanism which meant that we'd be using ranked choice voting for the primary. 
Um, and I don't blame you if you're confused by any of this because it was hard to keep up with. In the middle of all this, uh, we were sued. Uh, we actually lost count of lawsuits. Uh, Kristen has done a good job compiling all these for us. But we were sued by the Committee for Ranked Choice Voting uh, to force us to use ranked choice voting for the primary. Uh, we were sued by the Senate Republicans to prevent us from using ranked choice voting for the primary. And then finally in April, uh, on April 17th, the Supreme Court said that we would in fact be using it. That was the date that we actually learned that we are going to be using ranked choice voting for the June primary. Now, bear in mind that uh, when we had certified the people's veto, that left us exactly 100 days to implement ranked choice voting. So uh, we've been sketching this out for a while, but now it is given new urgency um, by the, uh, the certification of the people's veto and then the court ruling. So we had to get to work on implementation. Now, bearing in mind that we had absolutely no budget to do this, uh, we had to write some emergency rules to implement ranked choice voting. Uh, as, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but we had a couple of critical partners in all this. And one of them was our, our vendor election systems and software, which that's who we lease our DS200 tabulators from. They also lease us a DS850 high-speed tabulator. And they did the sorting software um, express vote, which that's not, that's actually the, um, the, the accessible voting solution. Um, they, they wrote the algorithm for the ranked choice voting solution, which I'll remember the name of here in a minute. <laughs> um, so the implementation, you know, we had to figure out how we were going to go about creating ballots. First of all, I mean, you had to, we had to determine where we we're going to do the central tabulation. The central tabulation is important here because rankings in the town of Kittery are going to mean something different than the rankings in the town of Caribou. So the cascade only really makes sense if you do it all at once. And that's a challenge with 503 towns, many of which count their ballots by hand. Some use tabulating machines, but this was something we had to figure out. First thing we did was came up with the grid style ballot that we released in May. Um, and the, the good thing about that was we got a lot of intelligent questions about that. So that told us we were not confusing the public. We determined uh, a location on the other side of the river from where I'm speaking right now. And then we had to get it secured with uh, card swipe locks, cameras, uh, dual lock um, entry. Uh, we had to find how, how to pay for it because again, we really didn't have any dedicated revenue for this. So we were able to move some things around to find a way uh, to pay for it. The, the central tabulation location in the Williams Pavilion this is on uh, the, the repurposed grounds of the old Augusta Mental Health Complex, um, which is a sprawling uh, place, all brick buildings from the 1880s. It's quite lovely, um, but it was never really meant to be used as an election center, but we repurposed it for that. Um, the implementation plan, we had to figure out you know, our training program for our, our town and city clerks, who are another critical partner in this. We can't do anything in elections without those local clerks and registrars. Um, so, and they are sovereign. I mean, we don't, they don't work for us. They are, they work for their towns. And, uh, you know, part of what makes this process accountable is the fact that we use paper ballots. We've never gone away from pa paper ballots. Just over half of our towns use optical scanners and the rest are all hand count. So, um, and you have to do, like I said, we do this all in, in one place. So, um, you know, the way we do recounts, um, if there's a question in election, the law says that state police will gather our election materials, but that was never addressed in the ranked choice voting law. And like I say, the governor was not terribly friendly to the idea of ranked choice voting. And so we were notified that state police would not be able to retrieve ballots for us. And sort of as a Hail Mary, one of our property management folks said, well, what about bonded couriers? And as it happened, uh, General Courier, based out of Biddeford, Maine, actually came in at something like a quarter of the cost of state police, which was a real help to us. So we had estimated it cost us about $50,000 for outreach, but I may have mentioned that we didn't have any money for this. So um, we had a car, which I used to get around, and we had laptops, and we had some pretty innovative ideas about presenting information. So we went to around uh, different places around the state. We went 
I think we went down to southern Maine a couple times. We were up up to Presque Isle, which is way up in northern Maine, uh, central Maine. So we made a bunch of locations. We put together some information for the internet, and every one of these presentations were incredibly well attended, um, and got a lot. Like I say, a lot of good questions. Only one time did somebody try to turn it into a debate about ranked choice voting, whether or not it was good. Um, that's not what we were there for. We were there to tell people how it was going to work. So one of the other things we did was we used uh, a piece of animation software and created an animated cartoon to explain how it was, would work to voters. Uh, we put out sample ballots. We had the timeline. We had examples of marked ballots, which is, this is really important because one of the most, the first question we got at every one of our panels was, do I have to rank my choices or can I just vote for one person? Or can I vote for one person, you know, six or seven times? And the answer was to both those questions was yes, except on the second case, it only counts one time. Um, we had our rules adopted that explained, you know, about how, what would happen. So we skipped um, how to deal with overvotes and undervotes. Um, so let me talk about the people that are doing this a little bit. You know, the vast empire that I oversee the at the elections division is nine people plus the deputy. Uh, we needed 14 people just to handle the materials. And so we had volunteers from um, the uh, Division of Corporations, Bureau of Motor Vehicles, the State Archives, and also our, our own central office here in, in Augusta, uh, in my office. So um, the, in, the entire thing required, you know, a pretty timely application of a lot of skilled people. So then we got to the primary. Um, so the June 12th was, was the primary. Um, the clerks uh, did their work very well. They got everything all packed up. Um, the understanding was if anybody gets 50% plus one, you don't need to rank the choices. You have your clear majority. And what we found, uh, we did a couple of, um, we did do a couple of tabulations using ranked choice voting, one for the Democratic primary uh, for governor and another for the Democratic primary for the second congressional district. So we, again, um, you know, we gave the clerks a day to finish up their results, understanding that we did not reach 50% for those two races. So we dispatched the courier on June 14th, began picking up things. We began doing the tabulation on the 15th, and then on the 20th, the tabulation was completed. So what did it look like? Why do you ask? That's what it looked like. This is the second congressional district and it shows, what this shows uh, is exactly how the votes were distributed. Um, in the first round, you see that uh, in the blue, um, Jared Golden, who ultimately won the primary, uh, was at 46% in the first round. And then when you eliminated the lowest vote getters, and maybe that's something we haven't really talked about, is how ranked choice voting actually works. You know, it's it, the way it's written in both the initiative and our rules, uh, we do have a provision for what we call batch elimination, where if more than one candidate has no chance to statistically of proceeding, you can eliminate them in a batch. Uh, we did that in the, in the first round, and it went down between Jared Golden and Lucas St. Clair. And when the final uh, sorting was done, Golden had 54.3% of the vote. Um, likewise, in the primary for governor, this is a little bit more robust. It actually went to four rounds. And one of the interesting things that emerged during the primary campaign, we had a couple candidates that would do television advertisements together and say, if you like me, vote for me first and vote for the other one second. And they would switch back and forth. And that was Mark Eves and Betsy Sweet. And that seemed to do her more good than him. Um, but in the, in the fourth round, uh, Janet Mills, again, came out on top with 54%. You can see in the bottom graphs about how the overvotes, undervotes, and exhausted choices were calculated. So, and then what the winning thresholds turned out to be. So we did uh, we did have one integration issue, and this is something that was a, a lesson learned. Uh, we had a number of towns, because of the way the districts were, were cut, that began to run out of ballots um, on election day. We authorized photocopying of ballots. Well, none of the tabulators would read the photocopy ballots. The, the paper just wasn't heavy enough. So um, we had to create a hand cast vote record, which is basically a spreadsheet. Um, 
and it and it ran into a snag uh, when we try to enter that information into the into the algorithm. Um, the, the because we capitalized the names of those towns, the algorithm thought they were new candidates and wouldn't read them. So we corrected that um, and uh, made a couple of other changes to the algorithm that made it faster. And then we released all the cast vote records, and the cast vote records basically show what the voter did, and also in a spreadsheet format so that anybody could actually replicate exactly what we had done in the tabulation. Again, transparency is our friend here. Um, so let's go forward. Um, what we learned, I mean, the transparent process really, was, like I say, that was what I think added to the public trust because we'd never done this before. We didn't have any way of knowing how long it was going to take. So uh, we didn't give a deadline. We didn't say, well, it's going to take five days or 10 days. We said, we're, this is where we are today. Um, even when we began collecting materials, we could tell people exactly how many towns we'd gathered, exactly how many had been processed, how many more we had to go. And we tried to provide data in real time as best as we could. Uh, things went very efficiently. And the most important thing, obviously, was that we had the paper ballots, we had the cast vote records, which sort of assured that we had an accurate result. Um, now, you know, we had a, a couple of things that worked in our favor on this. You know, we had the existing relationship with uh, a vendor ESNS, uh, and they um, were very supportive of, uh, you know, they had the technical skill to support what we were doing, and uh, they were an, they were an incredibly um, important partner. So having that uniform statewide system already in place, how we do recounts, if we have to do a statewide recount, we have a mechanism for that. Um, and we and and the centralized tabulation is actually modeled on our recount procedures. So um, then the people's veto, by the way, um, was upheld. So the delay and trigger mechanism was repealed or vetoed by the people on the June 12th election. So that left us in a strange spot where we actually were going to have two different ways of electing people. Part of what the legislature did that was not vetoed because of those constitutional concerns about state races in the general election, the legislature had carved them out so that we would only be using ranked choice voting for the primary and then for federal races in the fall election. So people who are going to be voting in the fall election were still going to be voting via plurality for governor, state representative, and state senator. Ranked choice voting does not cover county races in Maine. It's only those top of the ticket races. So we'd be using ranked choice voting for the race for U.S. Senate and for the, for the Congress. Um, we did submit legislation to, to do funding for this. Um, and this was really important because we thought it would be a best practice to not mix up ranked choice races with plurality races on the same side of the ballot. And then we discovered a, a little bit to our anxiety that uh, the algorithm would actually not read the ballots properly if we mix them up. And this, you know, this became important because the legislature did not adjourn until August. And after the turning of the fiscal year, when our available revenues lapped back to the general fund, they decided to pass a bond package. And that necessitated a third page for our ballot, which almost doubled our cost. So we got legislation submitted and adopted by the legislature to fund about $335,000 of these new costs. Um, unfortunately, the governor vetoed it, and that veto was sustained. So we didn't have any money. Um, so you know, what we had to do was, again, public outreach was sort of done on the fly. And we got to the general election um, on November 6. We only had uh, one race that we used ranked choice voting for, and this was the a race for the second congressional district. And we determined that you know within 24 hours, I was very very close. Each candidate had about 46 percent of the vote. There was a four-way race for this. We had a pair of independents as well who ran. So we sort of duplicated what we did in June, and we began. Uh, the tabulation process, again, gathering all the materials. Uh, in the general election, uh, the tabulation, let me find my notes because I've gotten ahead of myself a little bit here. Not that I've forgotten, it's all burned into my memory. So um, 
you know, the Republican incumbent, Congressman Bruce Poliquin, filed a federal lawsuit to stop the tabulation. Uh, once it became apparent that we were going to go in this direction, he challenged the constitutionality of ranked choice voting and asked uh, a federal judge, uh, Judge Lance Walker, to um, um, basically declare him the winner and or start uh, to have a new election. Um, that was you know, that request was denied. And um, we began the process of gathering everything and entering in just as we did in June. Now, we did have an issue with 6,125 ballots that did not upload. And this caused a bit of panic. Um, what had happened there was that we had some records that had come from overseas voters. And we had told towns, do not run these through your tabulators because they won't, they won't tabulate properly. Well, about half a dozen towns did anyway. They got their numbers. They were happy, but they wouldn't. Uh, those cast vote records would not load uh, into the system for any of the ballots from those towns. So that's why that number was so large. Again, we corrected for that, and both candidates picked up quite a few more votes. Um, bearing in mind that in the initial uh, election, um, actually Poliquin was leading by about 2,500 votes, and then when we did the tabulation, um, this is what happened. Uh, the two independents were dropped off, William Hoare and Tiffany Bond. And then uh, you see there that Bruce Poliquin is leading by a very narrow margin. And then when we did the transfers, uh, Golden wound up winning by about a percent and um, showed him to be the winner of the ranked choice vote election. One of the funny things that happened about this, I mean, yeah, again, you know, we're seeing this at the same time as the voters, and uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, national media outlets that was observing this uh, was praising us for our, you know, very calm, homespun way of doing it, and uh, actually talked about me and my deputy Julie Flynn as basically your mom and dad fiddling with the computer because um, we we had a couple things trying to get the printer to work and a few other things. Um, but you know that particular discrepancy on the 6,000 votes did cause a bit more confusion and uh, sort of led to some other criticism, which I'll get into in a little bit. So what did it cost? Um, you know, this again uh, was about uh, $441,000 in the end analysis that combines the primary and the November general together, all the startup, um, and then uh, over half of that is to prep, print that separate referendum ballot. So after the election, uh, when we did that tabulation, uh, Congressman Poliquin requested a hand recount of all the ballots. And we had come up with some rules to conduct this. Um, again, never having done it before, we basically did it by sorting piles into, uh, ballots into piles of you know, candidate A, candidate B, and then other. And that actually went a lot more smoothly than we could have hoped, and it went very quickly. But we had several other recounts prior to that. So we had a bunch of ballots in hand, plus we had all the hand count towns in hand from the initial tabulation. So we began the recount on December 6, and we were moving roughly 27,000 ballots a day using about six recount teams of two people, one for each campaign supervised by one of our folks. So um, as information would come out, um, you know, the Republican Party and Congressman Poliquin's campaign uh, really went after the whole process. And of course, you know, there's a lot at stake. You kind of expect this. It was, it was, a, it was a bit of a challenge to try to uh, stay on an even keel with this and, and not allow voter confidence in the process to be uh, deleteriously affected. You know, but they, they talked about how it was a black box system. Uh, that the votes have been redistributed inequality, and that somehow we mysteriously found ballots. Um, you know, so the you know they they criticized some of our staffers. We had one staffer that had actually worked in one of the partisan offices in a prior career, and they questioned his integrity. Um, or, and one of the one of my favorites was that voters received the wrong ballots. People would swear out affidavits that they had received the wrong ballot on election day. Well, mechanically, that's not possible because, again, if they're using a tabulating machine, the tabulator would have rejected it. Every tabulator is programmed specifically for that precinct. So if they had the wrong ballot, the tabulator would not have accepted it. In a hand count town, those would have been found at the end of the night. So 
they never would have slipped through to the recount. So, but this was some of the, these are some of the things that were being said, um, mostly to cast doubt on the process, which was a challenge for us. So um, once we had gotten through all the ballots that were in hand, we'd gotten a few of the larger communities turned in to us um, you know, from, the, from, the, uh, from the courier. And the, the law says that on these major re recounts, the challenger has to pay a $5,000 deposit and they have to pay for the total cost of the recount. They only get their deposit back if the, if the numbers are overturned. So just as we're gonna get into the real meat of the recount, that's when Pong Congressman Poliquin withdrew his challenge. Uh, I wound up costing him just about uh, $14,000 for everything, and they signed off on the result of the election. So, um, but we still were in, in litigation, and, uh, and Congressman Poliquin did appeal the court decision on the emergency injunction to stop state officials from certifying the results. And then on the 21st of December, the first, the first Circuit Court of Appeals denied Poliquin's re request for injunctive relief, um, basically saying he didn't really show that he had any chance of success. Um, and, you know, that was kind of the end of it. So we uh, certified the result of the election. One of the things that the governor did, because I think I may have mentioned he didn't really like ranked choice voting, uh, he when we did the certificate of election for Congressman-elect Golden, um, he only would use his initials, he didn't sign his name, and he wrote in the margin, uh, stolen election. Um, so after uh, Governor Mills was sworn in, we created a new certificate and sent it down to the House of Representatives with a note saying that there was a factual error on the old certificate. So. Um, some of the things that we've learned about all this, you know, obviously you want to get this, you want to get funding in place. You need to have an adequate, fa secure facility. You need to have trained staff, um, you know, the technical capacity to upload electronic results and scan ballots. Uh, you know, voter outreach is really important. Training of local elections officials. I think, um, you know, public outreach, you know, working with legislatures, you know, all this that we went through uh, was it was it was quite a journey. And like I say, the, the big thing is uh, this is a major change and getting people to accept it is, is difficult, if not impossible. But you can get a lot of people to trust it. And that's if you use a transparent process, if you're accountable. Um, when we had those 6,100 ballots that didn't get moved into the system, um, you know, our folks were in a little bit of a panic. I said, well, just tell people what happened. Just tell them what happened and make the and make the corrected tabulation. And that's what we did. That way you never have to have a spun quote read back to you later on. I mean, obviously we want to get things right the first time, but when you've never done something like this before, there, there is an opportunity to make the odd mistake here and there or to have something that you did not foresee happen. You know, the, the lessons we learned in June about how the algorithm worked were incredibly important and made it work much. It actually took about half an hour to run the Democratic primary for governor in June. The, the, all those ballots for the second CD ran in about a tenth of a second uh, in November because we were able to, to, to sort of refine how that was working. We uploaded everything onto our website um, and you can check that out yourself. All the cast vote records are there. We've had a number of mathematicians actually be able to duplicate what we did. So, um, you know, as we've gone through this debate, really since uh, prior to the, you know, to the adoption of ranked choice voting, um, you know, as we're the ones that have to do all this, I think sometimes we've been somewhat unfairly portrayed as being um, not either not in enough support of ranked choice voting or actually openly opposed to it. The, the reality is, as elections officials, we have to make this thing work. And Historically, when we've made sweeping changes to election law, we've taken out a period and put in a semicolon. So this is a major, major change uh, with, again, with very few resources, which I'm happy to say the Veteran and Legal Affairs Committee yesterday voted unanimously to give us that funding that we didn't get before, some of which is going to be lost money because it's going to account for some interest payments that we're going to have to pay on, on unfulfilled contracts from last year, which is 
sort of a waste of money, but that's the, the net effect of having that original funding bill vetoed. So, but uh, it's it seems to have worked out. People seem to have trust the process. And I think the payoff for us is that I've talked with a number of voters who haven't followed this public debate. I mean, this has been, you know, you have to remember people have lives and they have to work for a living and people didn't really know very much about it and have come up to me and said, you know, I really kind of like that. I like being able to not pinch my nose and vote for somebody I don't really like to avoid electing somebody I hate. So I think uh, with that, Chris, I think that's uh, if people, that's what I have uh, for an overview, which is uh, really a thousand foot overview. There's obviously a lot more details involved. Well, thanks so much, uh, Secretary Dunlap. I found that it was really interesting to hear, you know, your perspective yet again on on these elections and to hear a bit more about the general election. I'm going to take uh, over screen control in just a second, um, and then we can get started with the question and answer session. Um, before we do that, I have just some some wrapping up to do. Uh, today's webinar has been recorded and we'll hold a brief Q&A session in a few moments. The recording and supplemental Q&A document that we put together after each webinar will be added to our webinar series archives on our website. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You can also check out our podcast, RCV Clips, anywhere you get podcasts. So now we'll move into the Q&A segment. Uh, I know we've gotten a few questions from uh, the audience already. Let me pull some of those up and and we'll dive right in. Uh, so we have, we've gotten two questions that are similar in nature um, about results, displaying results, how you how you guys reported out results. I know Maine doesn't have a history of providing unofficial results or didn't before ranked choice voting came into effect. So can you talk a bit about how, what your plans for the future are uh, for conducting preliminary RCV tallies in future RCV elections and if you have plans for conducting, or, or any plans to speed up uh, conducting that final tally in um, the, the that, eight days we've had. That's a great question. And, and one of the things we don't have uh, is election night reporting. And, and historically, because we're so diffuse, um, a big state, mostly small towns, a lot of the newspapers actually do the informal, unofficial result reporting on election night. Um, that and this is something that was pretty critical about the process of ranked choice voting is how do you get how do you get people to, uh, to understand how the results stand? We certainly didn't want to have a situation where it might be two or three weeks after election day before anybody had any idea how the election had turned out. So part of the process was to the first round would be done the way it always is done, which is on election night, um, towns would report their first place winners and that would give us the compass on whether or not we're gonna to have to go to rankings at all. So on election night, they, they would report the results as they always had, you know, whoever was leading, you know, um, and then, you know, the percentages. Those are completely unofficial, oftentimes not including things like overseas ballots, et cetera, which would be then put into the final certified results. So I think going into the future, I think the technology is there for us to do things like election night reporting. Some of that's going to depend on a lot of our of our non-electronic towns coming into that electronic age. That's predicated by broadband availability and some other issues. But I think um, so far this process has worked pretty well, where you have a familiar situation where you know it's 11 o'clock on election night and the press reports, you know, who the apparent leaders are in the race. And if nobody gets over 50% you have a pretty good idea at that juncture that you're going to be going to rankings. And that that's helped us out a lot. And can you talk a bit about uh, what you think the timeline will be going into the future if you don't get election night reporting, if you don't have um, that sort of transportation of election data, what the timeline might be for getting the round by round results if something does have to go to the rounds? Well, and again, all this is done centrally. So the round by round results are going to be, have to follow being having all those ballot boxes and memory devices transported to a central location, loaded into the algorithm and then run. So the, the, the rounds are actually done instantly. Um, we had talked mm -hmm. about, let's do round one and then, okay, now we're gonna announce round two, give them 15 minutes to think about it. We decided that that was just gonna be torturing people. So we just ran them all at once. And so they saw the end result with all the cast vote records and the, and the transfer of votes from one candidate to the next based on choices. 
bearing in mind that a lot of people don't rank their choices. You know, there was about 23,000 ballots that were uh, for the two independents, and not all of them ranked mm -hmm. their choices. So uh, in the end of it, you know, Golden wound up winning by about 3,500 votes. So he picked up some, so did Paula Quinn, uh, but a lot of people only voted for one candidate. So you're able to show that at the end, and I think that's the important part. Right. I think just to add to that, I know FairVote did some analysis of the transfer rate. I think it was something like 70% of voters, or maybe it was 80% of voters who ranked Bond or Hoare first had uh, a second or third choice count for Poliquin or, or um, Golden. Um, next question. What uh, This is related to what we were just talking about, but how did you determine the process for uh, adding absentee ballots online? Was it something where you were you were waiting for every single ballot to come in right before you were putting These those absentee, Yeah, those absentee ballots were peculiar to the overseas voters. Uh, in our implementation of the Military and Overseas Voter Empowerment Act, those absentee ballots come directly to our offices and we actually do those cast vote records and then we send the results on to the towns. That way, you know, you, you don't have those ballots getting lost in postal systems or held up in a mailbox somewhere. We know it's all coming to us. And then as a matter of transferring the cast vote records um, into the system. And in that particular case, we had a number of towns that we had given them their, their, those, those results, um, or they had absentee ballots um, that, or absentee ballot records that we had provided them. We told them not to reload them into their tabulators to do their final tabulation. Some of them did anyway. Um, and that, uh, because they're a different format, that was the issue there. And because they were a different format of ballot, uh, they, they, the algorithm wouldn't read them. And in fact, blocked off all the ballots from those towns from being uh, included in the cast vote records. So, you know, again, because you have, because you have everything in front of you, when the numbers weren't working, it's like we, we have fewer votes than we have cast vote records. That's how we caught it. And we caught it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Once we figured out what it was, it was easy to remedy. Uh, but that was the issue there. And, but it was all dealing with uh, overseas and military votes coming from abroad. Right. Uh, next question. We're getting a bunch rolling in, so I don't think we'll get to everything today. But uh, again, we will put out a Q&A document um, with answers to every question we do get. Were the results of each round, including the transfers, reported by precinct? Uh, no, they were just they were not reported by precinct. They were they were done by the entire district in that case. Uh, we could probably, mm -hmm. you know, we we don't we can't identify. Uh, individual ballots to their precinct because once they are put into the cascade, they're divorced from that. So uh, that's for the privacy of the ballot. Right. Um, do you, if ESNS could handle both RCV and non RCV races on the same side of a ballot, would you like to combine them? Would you prefer to be able to do that? I think we prefer not to, just so we wouldn't create confusion. You know, one of the things that came up, uh, we had. You know, a, a high level state official call and say, you know, you say we don't have ranked choice voting for governor. You know, him and his wife swore they ranked their choices for governor. Mm. And because they had done it by absentee, what we did is we called their town office and said, pull their absentee ballots so they can come in and inspect them. And they did. And they opened the envelopes and they, you know, put them in a new envelopes and they called us up and said, well, I guess we're crazy because they, they swore they had ranked their choices for governor. But they hadn't, you know, and mm -hmm. this is, again, also some of the some of that power of suggestion from people who uh, swore they got the wrong ballot. Um, you know, they, that wasn't possible. There was a proposal to open all those towns ballots, though their ballot boxes and look for them. But, you know, that wasn't possible anyway. So we didn't do it. Right. It is interesting for me, especially to hear this form of voter confusion coming out of these elections. It's something that I, I didn't really anticipate actually hearing about, um, but it, it obviously it's something that's happening. It's something that you need to be prepared to address. I, I think that's true. And, and again, the voters themselves, when they were voting their ballots, we heard very little confusion from voters. Right. But then after the fact, someone would tell, tell them, you know, the ballot was, was, you got the wrong ballot, or, 
you know, you were ranking choices. And, and, and in fact, we did have some people spoil ballots um, and say, oh, whoops, I thought I could rank my choice for governor. And they had wound up uh, voting mm. for more than one candidate in that case. But they were able to figure out that they weren't supposed to do that because they saw the grid ballot on the other side and they were able to get new ballots. And that was not systemic. It was isolated. But that's something to be prepared for. Right. I'll try and get through a couple more questions, but I, we are running up on our, our promised 45 minutes. Uh, has there been much or any inquiry from other secretaries of state or election administrators from around the country as to how they could start running ranked choice voting in their jurisdictions? And if so, can you provide an estimate as to how much interest there is or how many states have, have been in contact? I've heard from a few secretaries that, especially out in the West, where uh, their elections are, are managed on a countywide basis. And, and mm -hmm. I've had some inquiries pass me from county elections officials who are interested in it. Most of the interest has been rather guarded because this is such a major change. Mm -hmm. And you know our, our depth of experience really is a primary and a general election. So I think as we are able to refine the process, um, it's important to note that no two states run their elections exactly the same way. Uh, we have a lot of advantages that work for us. We have really good town clerks. We have things like election day registration, uh, no excuse absentee balloting. So we have a lot of access for voters already, which I think help alleviate some some misconceptions about how to participate in the process. So that, that helps us. Right. <clears throat> well, I think I'll ask just one more question. Um, and we'll we'll leave it there. You talked about this a bit during the presentation, but what were key factors for you all in estimating the cost of getting ranked choice voting up and running in Maine? Well, this was something that got a little hot for us more than once. And I was in front of our appropriations committee and they were reading back our, our estimates over the previous couple of years. Like, well, you said it was going to be X number of millions of dollars. And then you said, well, no, it's only going to be X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then you said, well, we can actually do what we have. And now here you are asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars more. And the reason for that really was that they kept changing the rules under our feet. You know, you had the original initiative um, and then they, you know, they passed that legislation that was gonna have the delay and trigger mechanism. And then you had the people's veto. And then, you know, we are only gonna be using it for federal races and primaries. And, and this was all happening almost as fast as I'm describing it. So it was hard to keep a handle on what our actual costs were going to be. Um, and we lucked out in many ways, especially around you know, the, the use of the bonded courier, which turned out to be much cheaper and just as secure as state police. That was a, a great boon for us. And now state police is interested in them doing all the stuff for recounts too. So it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's uh, you know we, there were some unanticipated benefits and some real challenges in estimating those costs. It was really based on what we needed for people, uh, hardware, software, and and space and time. Right, the those big things in elections. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, thank you uh, so much again, Secretary Dunlap, for coming on today and presenting for, for our audience. I know I found this really helpful and I really appreciate all the work that your office and all the, the city clerks throughout the state of Maine did to get ranked choice voting up and running for your voters. Well, thank you. I mean, I know this is a lot of people tuned into this. Uh, when we did our initial tabulation, uh, that we ran the tabulation in June for the primary, as an afterthought, uh, we decided to do a a Facebook live feed, which had like a million and a half viewers. So there's a lot of interest in this for sure. Yeah, I remember I, I was on those Facebook lives. It was exciting to see like thousands of people tuning in all at once to, to watch it all go down. Uh, well, thanks again. And Thank you. yeah, we'll, we'll send out a recording in the next week or two, along with, as I mentioned, that uh, Q&A document with answers to all the great questions we did not get to get to today. Uh, thanks again. Thank you.